Okay, so this is the pre-lecture for uh, Tuesday, February 23rd, uh, on where we're going to be talking about ad adaptive management. And uh, my task is to kind of go is to go through three things. One is uh, where did this all come from? Uh, Walters and Holling and uh, their seminal paper from 1990, large-scale management experiments and learning by doing, which is uh, often used as the touchstone for adaptive management. And <clears throat> then Ross and Rob are going to take us through a series of examples of uh, what adaptive management means uh, within the federal government and case studies of places where it seems to work and not work. And I'm going to, uh, for this um, lecture, focus on uh, the back end bit, the monitoring, uh, conservation evidence and evidence-based conservation will be uh, featured in, in, this, in this talk. Uh, so uh, let's start by thinking about uh, Holling and uh, Walters. So uh, this is Buzz Holling up here in the upper uh, right. He was uh, Canadian by birth. He worked for a while at the University of British Columbia, then went on to the University of Florida and um, uh, worked on forests and forest management. And he uh, wrote several things. But if you notice in this uh, Wikipedia uh, clip out, 1978 Adaptive Environmental Assessment and Management. So this 1990 paper is, is not even the first time that these guys uh, were thinking about adaptive management, that it was uh, it existed uh, prior, prior to that. Uh, but they did write this paper, which became a, a very a touchstone uh, for this field. But he thought about resilience and stability of ecosystems, and, and he thought a lot about uh, f uh, outbreaks of insects and was beginning to think about non-equilibrium transient systems that we have to think about changing as, as they change in time. Uh, Carl Walters uh, is at, was at the uh, University of British Columbia, and so Holling and Walters, I presume, uh, met and started thinking about these things in uh, conjunction uh, there. Uh, but he's a fisheries biologist, and so this is the combination of a forest guy and a fisheries guy, and so it's not, not surprising. But if they wrote, uh, so Walters' 1986 Adaptive Management and Renewable Resources is a book. And uh, so he he's, uh, has a long history on this as well. So they're thinking about this before this 1990 uh, paper, but this is where they really formalize it for natural resource management. If you look at a Wikipedia on adaptive management, uh, you know, the interesting uh, entry here, the uh, use of adaptive management techniques can be traced back to peoples from ancient civilizations, for example, the Yap people of Micronesia, blah, 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 blah. Well, I mean, this idea of plan, uh, do, monitor, learn, and then adapt is sort of a well-duh concept, you know, that the alternative to adaptive management, you know, I'm going to continue to do something no matter what the evidence tells me, is, you know, a ridiculous concept. And so really the idea of adaptive management is the formalization of how we think about doing it within a resource management uh, perspective. And so n no doubt that this kind of approach of being uh, careful about how we set up uh, learning so that we can adapt our management to do better uh, is um, is an old idea applied very specifically in a, in a new way. And so now we think of uh, adaptive management as reactive to something that happened, uh, passive, uh, where we're not really doing or te treating our treatments as natural experiments and not really being uh, that specifically mindful about it, but then uh, trying to learn from it, and, and active, where we're actually establishing management as experimental treatments. And so I like that people talk about adaptive management, and people, uh, you often hear critiques of adaptive, uh, of, uh, or lamenting the, how the term adaptive management is thrown all over, around now, and very little of it is uh, Hollings and Walters' uh, adaptive management, and, and that active adaptive management is what they were talking about. So I like to think of it as Holling adaptive management, or HAM, as opposed to AM, uh, just to distinguish the two. But this paper uh, in 1990 focused on large-scale systems, focused on uncertainty, uh, and recognized that systems were uh, non-equilibrial, uh, recognized the need for uh, experiments, and, and quite importantly, emphasized strategic uh, investment in effort. They recognize that you can't be doing everything, and so you have to be very careful about where you deploy these experiments because they don't, they're not free, and that you have to think about what the most important information that you're trying to learn about the system actually is. And of course now uh, we have lots and lots of adaptive management cycles. 
uh, conservation measures uh, partnership up in the upper left, the one up in the upper right, I, uh, um, we've seen from the CSIRO site on management strategy evaluation. I think the one that's in the center with the blue circles is what's in the Department of Interior uh, guidebook. Uh, the one in the lower left is uh, out of the California Department of Fish and Game. Um, you scan the web, you get lots of different ones. Some farm, farm organization had the one down uh, on the bottom right, and that includes this whole participatory learning idea. And so that's uh, the adaptive management cycle. And as I've said uh, on a number of occasions, um, the conservation, the open standards uh, are promoted by um, the uh, Conservation Measures Partnership is a project management program for adaptive management. And so they, they couch the thing uh, there, what they do, their efforts in um, an adaptive management framework. Well, so uh, the Conservation Measures Partnership back in 2009 started a process, or 2010, started a process of trying to get the world together on results-based management and think about how they were doing. and. Uh, Matt Muir, uh, shown here with the Andean Cat paper, uh, he was a graduate student here. He went through the open standards training. He helped the first uh, conservation management um, course uh, go off. Uh, and then he went and worked for Foundations of Success and now works for the International Office of the Fish and Wildlife Service. And, one of the, and he's one of the principals now in the uh, Conservation Measures Partnership. He was uh, contracted uh, to summarize information, so he went around and asked all of the NGOs how they were doing and had uh, key people from various NGOs uh, respond and saying, uh, of, of these different, uh, 20 different steps, like planning the project scope, identifying partners in the process, uh, getting stakeholders in the planning process, identify the conservation targets, the threats, the actions, uh, these things that we're now familiar with with the open standards. How, many, how often do you do this? And, and you can see what happens is that almost all projects get through the planning uh, phase. Uh, some of them uh, you know, don't get deep into the planning phase, uh, like prioritizing actions or you know, articulation of a logic model. That's that conceptual model that we're working on. Um, lots of projects do stuff. Uh, but then when you get down to 14, 15, 16, 17, this is where uh, we are monitoring uh, our outcomes. And we're down here into some to few projects are doing things like developing a monitoring plan, implementing the monitoring plan, assessing the status of the, of the targets, and assessing the performance of the action, number 17. That's, that's the, where the rubber hits the road. Uh, and, and we get it's even worse down uh, over there at number 18, use data to adapt and learn. Uh, and, and then 19 and 20 are about sharing the data. These things don't happen very often, and that this is a, a real problem. And so I'm going to focus the rest of this uh, basically on that idea of how we do better on the back end of that adaptive management cycle. And uh, there's something called the Cochrane Collaboration. It started some over 20 years ago now, but uh, it really focused on, on medicine. And uh, now you go to the Co you Google up Cochrane Collaboration, and you get the Cochrane Project. It's a, a, a nonprofit, and they are um, as assembling evidence uh, for better health decisions. And they've partnered with Wikipedia to, to create this wiki project, Medicine. And, uh, and they have a foundation to support it. The idea is that we need to be better about collecting both positive and negative in evidence about uh, interventions uh, in human health. And um, this came as about a, a bit of a shock to me because I thought that's what all clinical trials were all about. But, uh, but they really, I think, are talking about is, you know, doctors are in hospitals and they do stuff. Sometimes it succeeds and sometimes it fails. And they had a problem of reporting failure. And now they've been able to uh, um, convince the world that this failure information is important and by uh, forcing doctors to record failures they can do a better job of learning. Well uh, Andrew Pollan and Bill Sutherland uh, shown here uh, took this on and here you can see the the paper trail that these are the most widely cited papers when you uh, Google or when you ISI search evidence-based conservation but Pollan and uh, uh, Knight Effectiveness in Conservation uh, Practice, Pointers from Medicine and Public Health uh, in 2001. So Andrew was right on top of this uh, six, 15 years ago. Um, a couple of years later, uh, Poland, Sutherland and Poland, the need for evidence-based conservation, and then uh, Sutherland uh, predicting the ecological uh, 
consequences of environmental change, a review of methods, and that these people were uh, really uh, integrally interested in thinking about this uh, problem of how you aggregate information in a world where we uh, aren't very good at reporting uh, uh, what works and we're really bad about reporting about what doesn't work. And so they've both gone on to uh, uh, start organizations and they run their organizations slightly differently. Uh, Bill Sutherland runs this one, Conservation Evidence, and he's at um, Cambridge. And what he's doing is he's aggregating information. So you can browse things by category. Uh, if drilling down here, this is what, the, what it says under amphibians, uh, that there's, you can refine the category. I've clicked on species management. And out of 22 different summaries on uh, uh, amphibian species management, you have 15 on captive breeding and seven on translocation. Down here at the bottom, um, you look at translocation, you see translocation of amphibians, frogs, great crested newts, and natterjack toads, and then the, the various different studies that, uh, that do this. And so uh, they're vetting and then posting information to help people figure out uh, what works and uh, what doesn't work. So that, that, that's, that's pretty cool. But it's not uh, very systematic. So uh, again, it's not good at reporting. It's not going to fix the uh, non-reporting issue. It's, it's, it's aggregating uh, reports. Uh, Andrew Poland is taking a slightly different approach. He's a lead editor on biological conservation uh, down here at the bottom. And in one of the areas that you can submit papers in in, in biological conservation is uh, systematic reviews. And he's got a whole process for doing systematic reviews. That, And he works through this uh, Center for Evidence-Based Conservation at the University of Bangor. And, uh, and that he has uh, got this other thing called environmental evidence. And they're trying to foster uh, um, systematic reviews on topics to try and do the best job possible, basically meta-analyses on, on uh, projects. OK, so that's those two uh, areas. Um, another thing that I think is important, and I think I've alluded to this, is the, is the social component of monitoring. So. Uh, this is a paper by Jim Sankirko and a few others of us, uh, and we were kind of uh, irked at uh, the way that uh, we as a community of, of scientists have been going with respect to think, you know, fetching about how monitoring isn't really uh, being very effective. And here, Dave Lindenmeyer and Gene Likens in 2009 wrote this paper about adaptive monitoring. And, and, and look at this thing, what they're saying. They're saying, set questions, design monitoring, collect data, analy analyze it, understand it. You have new questions, and you and you go back and restate them. Well, yeah, sure, but uh, we're not sure that this is actually the limiting constraint. And and uh, is it really that people fail to set these questions? Uh, I'm not entire, entirely sure. And if it's if it's failing to uh, set the questions or collect data, why is there a failure there? Is it a failure because we don't think that it's a worthwhile investment of our time, or is it a failure of uh, projects that have the appropriate training trained people? Uh, McDonald Madden, about the same time, wrote a decision tree uh, over here on the right, and again, thinking, uh, you know, basically a very sciencey uh, approach or natural sciencey approach to this whole problem. Uh, we suggested that that there might be a real social problem here, and that <clears throat> if we have this adaptive uh, monitoring cycle, we're going to conceptualize objectives and plan actions and, and collect the data and analyze and respond and even share the learning up over there by the sea, uh, that these uh, aster or the italicized groups uh, need to be involved uh, in, in the, into conceptualizing these goals. I mean, if the policy elites are the ones who are um, setting the budgets and funding it, they have to uh, embrace the idea that the monitoring actually needs to be done as opposed to spending that limited set of resources on some other action. Uh, so they have to be convinced. And similarly, when, turning, when planning the monitoring, um, it's not just the resource managers or the scientists that need to be there. It's the funders and the stakeholders. And uh, in order to make sure that you're collecting information that will be valid in their decision process. Uh, and so there's uh, a lot to think about there. And just uh, uh, down the home stretch here, and I'll get in before 15 minutes, uh, our paper goes on to think about conflict in this role and how if you have a, 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 an environment in which uh, decisions are made under a large conflict, um, you can fail to get monitoring done just because people don't want uh, information because information might lead to decisions that they don't want. And so it really uh, becomes critical uh, to think about uh, who are the policy brokers and how can they help or derail um, 
um, decisions. And maybe Ross will talk. Maybe Ross will talk about this. But a part of the problem is, is this a problem that's peculiar to the NGO world? Uh, and if we don't get to that, I'll try and talk about that on Monday.